Hello, I'm Pat Cosgrove, and I'd like to welcome you to Cosgrove's Cosmos. Today I'll be sharing with you my most recent imaging project, a 12-hour narrowband exposure of Pickering's Triangle, rendered in the Hubble color palette. Let's get started. This video is just a short overview of my Pickering's Triangle imaging project. A much more extensive posting can be found on my website, including a detailed processing walkthrough if you're interested in that kind of thing. I'll include a link below. I should mention that I started my journey into astrophotography in August of 2019, just after I retired. Since then, counting this image, I have I've completed 111 imaging projects, all which are documented on the website, so you may want to check that out. I'd like to talk about two things about the project today. First, I'll talk a little bit about the background of Pickering's Triangle, and then I'd like to talk about some of the high-level strategies I use in processing this image. This time of year, the constellation Cygnus is really well positioned for me, and I've been choosing targets that can be found within it. Examples of recent projects from this area include the Bat Nebula and my image of the Flying Dragon. This time around, I was considering doing another study of a portion of the Cygnus Loop, much as I did with the Bat Nebula. I've heard of a target called Pickering's Triangle, and while I was familiar with the name, I was not familiar with the object, what it looked like, or where it was. To my surprise, when I researched this a bit, I found that it did not have a catalog designation. It was discovered in 1904, right after the new general catalog was first published, so it missed out being part of that. But for some strange reason, it was never picked up from any other catalog that was created around Nebulae after that. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as Gen NGC uh, 6979, but this is incorrect. And while it's commonly done, it's just wrong. Well, this object is called Pickering's Triangle. So who is this Pickering fellow? Well, in 1904, Edward Charles Pickering, was the director of the Harvard College Observatory. He must have been the one who discovered this object, right? Well, no. It was actually discovered photographically by Wilhelmina Fleming. But it was named after the director of the observatory that she worked for, since that was common practice at the time. That seems a little unfair to me. An early woman pioneer in astronomy forced to hand credit over for a discovery that she made to the male leadership of her observatory. But I suppose we shouldn't criticize Edward Pickering too quickly. If you look more at the backstory, it turns out Wilhelmina first worked for Pickering as his maid. And after a little bit of time there, she was invited by him to join the observatory to take on some administrative responsibilities. He soon began to teach her how to analyze stellar spectra, and she became one of the founding members of an all-female cadre of human computers which analyzed the data collected by the observatory. So while Pickering did get this object named after him, we can't be too hard on him because he seems to have been instrumental in bringing women into an all-male dominated profession and allowing them to contribute. So let's get back and talk about the target a little bit more. So we know it doesn't have a classification, but it does have a common name. I began to do some searching to see what I could find about this object. As part of my research, I went on to astrobin.com and I searched for images of Pickering's Triangle. And I found many fine samples, but I was surprised to see almost all of the samples that were there were taken as bicolor images using hydrogen alpha and oxygen in the familiar HOO color palette. These produce images that have a strong red-blue uh, color palette, um, and that can, this can be quite pleasing for a lot of images. I was just a little bit surprised that uh, there weren't other approaches to the image. While there were a few full narrowband shots, not that many. Uh, and I know from my own experience of shooting images in the Veil and in the Cygnus Loop area, that there's quite a bit of sulfur to signal, so there's no reason not to do that. So I decided this might be an interesting target to take on, and maybe I could do my own little twist on it by doing a full narrowband and using the Hubble palette for the output. So I went ahead and I captured 12 hours of 5-minute subs on all three narrowband filters. 
We had four nights of really clear weather, and so the quality of the subs that I got were quite good. These were captured on my Williams Optics 132F7 FLT APO telescope platform. This platform has a ZWO 1600 MM Pro mono camera and is mounted on an Ioptron CEM 60 mount. After pre-processing the data in PixInsight, I ended up with three master linear images. Here you can see the master hydrogen alpha image. And here is the oxygen three. And finally, we have the sulfur two. I have documented the detailed processing steps used for this image in my extensive web post. But I thought what I would do here is to highlight a few aspects of my processing workflow that I typically use for narrowband images. The first is the use of a synthetic luminance image. I'm a great believer in having twin processing tracks, one for the luminance image and one for the color image. The luminance, of course, is processed to have the peak sharpness and detail, while the color images are doing just that. They're providing color information. And as such, they can be relatively soft and uh, low noise, but we want the signal of the color to come through clearly. In order to create a luminance image for narrowband, I need to create a synthetic one. And I do that by using the image uh, integration process. The three master images are written out to a file and they're pulled into the image integration tool. The image integration tool is set up so that I have a basic averaging approach to, bringing, to, to integrating the images, but I've disabled any rejection since I'm not really looking to reject data. I'm looking to see how I can combine three images and to have one that has peak signal to noise and informational content. And that's precisely what the image integration tool will do. Once that runs, it creates a new luminance image. Um, and it does so by um, the weighting the contribution of the three images put into it based on the signal to noise and their information content. In this particular case, we produced a luminous image that looks like this. This is actually a pretty detailed and nice looking image. Uh, in creating this image, if you look at the weights that were reported by the image integration tool, you can see that the greatest contribution came from the oxygen-3 signal, followed by the hydrogen alpha, and finally the sodium-2. The next aspect I'd like to talk about is my use of starless image processing. I typically create my first SHO color nonlinear image by using the LRGB combination tool, and I take the master images for the narrowband filters as well as the synthetic luminance and combine them. Now that I have a nonlinear color image, it often has a strong green color balance, um, typical of these combinations, and I use the SCNR tool with an 80% reduction on the green channel. That produces an image that looks like this. My next step is to use the StarNet 2 tool to create a starless version of that image and another version of the image, which is just stars. Here's the starless version. And here is the image of just stars. This separation of star and starless images is quite handy. I can now be quite aggressive with the starless image, really stretching that image to bring the signal out of the weeds without worrying about distorting my stars. On the other hand, stars from a narrowband image often can be a little funky. They often can have a pink cast or other undesirable cast. Now that I have an image of just stars, I can manage the color of those stars, and I can also manage the intensity of those stars. I can darken them a little bit, which tends to shrink the stars and make them a little bit smaller. Once both images are where I want them, I can recombine them. In the past, I used to just add them together with pixel math. But recently, I have been using a star blend script, which is very effective at doing a much more natural combination. This script has been popularized by James Lamb, and I think it does a great job. Here's a picture of the final images. Another aspect of my image processing that I'd like to discuss is noise reduction. 
When you're dealing with astro images, which are routinely starved for light, noise reduction becomes an important element to your image processing. I suspend loads of time doing noise reduction. I use different tools at different points of the processing chain, trying to get the results I wanted to have. It was iterative, it was slow, it was awkward, and it often produced results that fell short of what I was trying to achieve. This is no longer the case. I bought a license for RC Noise Exterminator, which is a smart AI tool which handles noise reduction. It works on both linear and nonlinear images and has a very simple control interface that allows you to dial in just the level of noise reduction that you want and produces a result which I think is very pleasing to the eye. This has changed how I do noise reduction. I now use one tool. I still use it at different parts of the imaging chain, but I feel like I have a lot more control and I spend less time at the, the step process of doing this and I produce a result that I'm much happier with. This is a tool that is a premium tool you have to pay for, but I heartily recommend it. It's fundamentally changed a lot of what I do when I process my images. The other tool that I'd like to highlight is one that deals with the problem domain of star reduction. Bill Blanchin has created a set of very elegant pixel math expressions that allows you to do star reduction in a very natural way. The controls are intuitive and easy to understand, the execution is very fast and rapid, and the results it produces are very natural and very easy to control. I have been super impressed with this tool and have given up all my other tools and use this almost exclusively. Bill, you've done a great job with this and you've created a real resource for the Astro community. Thank you. And with that, I'm gonna draw this video to a close. I hope you found this video useful and I would encourage you to check out the full project posting on Cosgrove's Cosmos. As always, your comments and questions are welcomed and I especially thank you for taking your time with me today as I try to learn the video side of this endeavor. I appreciate your encouragement and support and if you could subscribe and ring the bell, it would certainly help this channel get off the ground. In a few more days, I'll be posting the next project, which is uh, on NGC 6888, which is the Crescent Nebula. Until then, I hope you have clear skies and excellent seeing.